Okay, so welcome again to the last block of uh, day one for uh, MicroTNA Small is Beautiful. We have the pleasure to have, uh, to have you for the second time, uh, Jacob. And um, you are going, you're about to present constructing a 13 limit uh, just intonation, six tone scale, scale and 19 limit 12 tone scale. So, J Jacob Elkin is a musician and composer based in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, through the integration of uh, space, noise, and microtonality, his, co his compositions seek an abstract expression of contemporary concerns. His electronic works have been featured around the world in a variety of venues. Mr. Elkin is an advocate for new music and has premiered many pieces for trombone, in solo and ensemble settings. He works as brass instructor for the United Nations uh, International School. Uh, please welcome uh, Jacob Elkin. Welcome. <laughs> great, thank you so much. It's so great to see you and other familiar faces. Um, yeah, the only thing I would add to that introduction is, you know, uh, last year before quarantine, I had the great opportunity to play uh, with Johnny Reinhardt, um, a really interesting opera by Christian Klinkenberg, which he yes. presented at our last uh, symposium, um, The Glacier. Yes. Um, so it was a great honor for me to play for the American Festival of Microtone Music. I guess that was two years, two years ago now. Um, yeah, anyway, so I'm a trombonist and composer. Uh, let me share my screen so I can start my presentation. Share computer sound. Okay. Good, so constructing extended just intonation six and 12 tone scales. Um, so the purpose I wanna get into uh, before, before we start looking at, at ratios and tables and all the numbers. Um, the reason I started putting together these scales, um, which are just intonation approximations of EDO scales, um, was came about through my work um, in performing microtonal music, where uh, when I first started playing quarter tone pieces, I started to notice that there were kind of intonation tendencies for those quarter tones in the same way that there were intonation tendencies for major third, minor third, etc. Um, so I wanted to investigate that further um, and I've gotten all the way to 12 tones. Um, and one of the main purposes for this is to help musicians to more accurately uh, perform in these uh, microtonal systems. Um, and the other main reason is analysis for composers, especially to have a meaningful comparison to five limit harmony. Um, I think it's really difficult, uh, for example, if you're looking at a 24-note EDO scale to say, okay, D quarter sharp, can I really compare that to, you know, a D in a five-limit system? Um, is it really related to it? How is it related to it? And I think by um, assigning a ratio to these pitches, we can have a more meaningful um, connection to those and get a better look at how we can view them in a harmonic uh, setting. So um, the guidelines for constructing these were all based on um, what we know about how we tune and which ratios we use for our five limit 12 um, EDO systems. So um, just like in that system, I wanted to choose only one ratio per interval whenever possible. Um, the further we divide in the 12 tones, uh, et cetera, six tones, there are many, many options that in some cases are very close together, maybe just four cents apart, where it seems like, you know, uh, either one could work. And I wanted to choose as much as I could just one of them. Um, the second was to approximate the EDO intervals to get as close as I can. I'll talk about this more as we look at those. Um, but, you know, in five limit, the furthest we get away from um, any of our 12 EDO intervals would be 16 cents about. So we're trying to stay relatively close to um, what we would use on an equal tempered. Um, the next is maintain the lowest prime limit possible. So there may be 
options that are very close if I mo move to a higher prime limit, like 27 limit. Um, but I wanted to get as close to these intervals without going too high in my prime limit, kind of maintain as low as I could while still getting really close to the intervals. Okay, next is use reciprocals. Um, so there are a few reasons for this. The, the main reason is because that's generally what we do when we're tuning five limit systems is um, we're using reciprocals instead of using entirely different um, ratios. And then the last one is maintain maximum consonants, the lowest complexity possible. So this is another thing I'll talk about um, in the following slides about um, if we have two options that both seem like good choices, we want to look at them, and if one of them has a lower complexity value, it's slightly more consonant, then we should choose that one. Okay, so the next question is how do we measure that? Um, so I looked at a few different ways of measuring consonants or measuring complexity, and one of the best ones that I found was Tenney height, um, named after the American composer James Tenney. Um, it's basically based off of a pre-existing um, measurement of complexity called Benedetti height, which is the product of the numerator and denominator of a ratio reduced to the lowest terms or the least common multiple. So for example, Benedetti height of 3 over 2, 3 times 2, which is 6, and the Benedetti height of 4 over 3, 4 times 3 is 12. Okay, um, so you can notice that perfect fifth is half the value of the perfect fourth, the lower the value, the less complex it is. Um, Tenney height just takes these numbers and takes the log base two of them. And that's really useful because it kind of lowers our numbers, especially as we get to more complex ratios. Um, when we find the least common multiple, sometimes they're very high numbers, especially if we're doing multiple ratios, if we're trying to find the complexity of a chord. Um, taking a log base two just means that we're dealing with smaller numbers. Um, so for example, the log base two, the Benedetti height of three over two is 2.585 instead of six and 4 over 3 is 3.585 instead of 12. Um, the other benefit for this is that instead of being double the number uh, for the reciprocal, it's always going to be just plus 1, um, which, as I note at the end of the slide, means that we can normalize these values. So if we want to say that a perfect fifth is equally consonant to a perfect fourth, we can very easily adjust those numbers for every um, ratio that we're using. Okay, um, another uh, way of looking at complexity that I found or measuring complexity was Wilson height, named after Herb Wilson, um, the American musicologist. This takes the sum of the prime factors of the numerator and denominator, so 16 over 15 as an example, prime factors of 16 are 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, Prime factors of 15 are 5 times 3, so we get the Wilson height by adding all of those numbers together, 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 5 plus 3, so it has a Wilson height of 16. Um, this way of looking at complexity gives a much higher weight to higher prime limits. So for example, if you have a prime factor of 13 in your ratio, it's automatically going to have a higher value. Um, and again, just like in Tenney height, larger values mean higher complexity. Okay, so now I want to look at generally accepted ratios for five limit just intonation. So this is like our 12 EDO. Um, this is what like most musicians are um, basing their intonation off if they're playing in an orchestra or in a chamber group. Um, some of the things I talked about with the guidelines, we can see here, like, um, again, the furthest any of them is from the equal temperament value would be 15.64 cents. So we can say that's kind of our margin for error, at least for our six tones, um, that we want to stay kind of within that. Um, it does use reciprocals based around a point of symmetry at um, the tritone. Uh, which I'll talk more later about the tritone in, in the sixth tone and twelfth tones. Um, but, you know, we're going to have equal uh, number of utonal and otonal uh, ratios, except we'll have an extra one because we have an, an odd number um, 
based around the point of symmetry at the tritone. Um, limits. So we're in five limits, so our options for limits are basically just five and three, excluding the unison and the octave. Um, but just notice that we have kind of a diversity of limits. We have not just three limits, not just five limits, but we have both. Um, good, and we have Tenney height and Wilson height. You can just notice a few things like our um, lowest Tenney height and Wilson height value is going to be the perfect fifth, which is generally what you'd expect. Um, the next would be the perfect, perfect fourth, again, generally what you would expect. And then the major six, the major third, minor third, generally what we consider the more constant intervals are going to have lower Tenney height values and also lower uh, Wilson height values. And uh, the more dissonant intervals, like the major seventh, the minor second, are, have our higher values. One thing that's interesting to note that our Wilson height values for the minor seventh and the major seventh are the same number, 14. So 16 over 9 and 15 over 8 in Wilson height have the same value, um, which in Tenney height, they don't, um, which I think is an important thing to note. And kind of, to me, one of the flaws of Wilson height is that we have a lot of intervals that are going to have the same value. And, you know, at least from what I hear, I don't necessarily believe they're exactly as consonant. So um, next slide. This has the entire six tone scale. Um, again, 13 limit, um, which I've selected out of all the intervals available, um, low limit intervals available. Um, notice a big difference here. We do have two tritones. So we have seven over five and 10 over seven as possibilities. Those are also the furthest deviation, 17 and a half cents away. Um, the reason for me is, you know, they're very closely um, consonant, so I think it makes sense to include both of them. Um, if you're performing and you had a tritone interval to play, obviously you'd have to select one, um, and you might have some kind of interpretive decision to make um, as far as that. Okay, so here we have the same intervals with the Tenney height, Wilson height, limit, and tonality. Um, I'm going to look at Tenney height and Wilson height in the next slides, um, but notice that the limits, again, we have a diversity of values. Um, so we're not just using 13 limits, we're not just using 11 limits. And I think this is really important if we want to construct chords, we have some more options if we want something that uses mainly 11 limit, mainly 13 limit, mainly 7 limit. We have those ratios available to us. Um, and the tonalities, I'll just tell you there's an even number of O-tonal and utonal. Okay, so looking at tenny height in order of ascending tenny height, um, this is just up to the tritone, just to kind of limit the number of ratios we're looking at on one page. Again, since we're using the reciprocals, um, we can get basically the same information from looking up to the tritone as we could by looking at all the intervals. Um, we're just excluding the reciprocals in this case. So again, we have for our most consonant or least complex intervals, kind of what we would expect. In this case, the perfect fourth, because the perfect fifth is on the other side of um, the halfway point for our octave. So our perfect fourth is the most consonant, followed by major third, minor third. And then we get to some more interesting ones. Notably, the tritone is one of our more uh, consonant intervals or less complex intervals. Um, also noting that 7 over 6, 8 over 7, 9 over 7 are considered less complex by the system than 9 over 8, one of our five limit intervals. Um, and then of course at the bottom you get mostly what you would expect. Some of our, our intervals that are very close to the unison um, are our most complex intervals. Okay, so looking at the uh, kind of the same thing, but in Wilson height, um, so the ratio is ascending by order of Wilson height, we get something very similar, but slightly different. Um, some notable things. In this case, using Wilson height, 9, 8 is considered less complex than 8 over 7 and 9 over 7, again, because it's a lower limit, lower prime limit, um, and Wilson height kind of gets a, a lower value automatically. Um, so you can see side by side, 
most things are pretty similar. There's just a few differences. And again, I just want to point out one of the flaws of Wilson height here is we have, for example, um, three intervals, 7 over 5, 7 over 6, and 9 over 8. They're all given a Wilson height of 12. So we would say those are have the, the same complexity, which I think is a little bit counterintuitive to what you hear if you listen to them. So um, some alternate intervals. Um, again, since one of my guidelines was to choose just one ratio for each interval, um, there are many that are really close and that you might consider them. And one of the ways that I made the decision of choosing one was calculating the Tenney height and finding the one that was you know, least complex by that standard of measurement. Um, but there are some examples like 49 over 48 where I chose 50 over 49, even though 50 over 49 actually has a higher Tenney height than 49 over 48 by a small amount, because the reciprocal of 49 over 48 has a higher Tenney height than the reciprocal, reciprocal of 50 over 49. Um, so that's another thing to think about. Again, if we normalize the Tenney height, then that wouldn't be an issue, and you could make a different decision in that regard. Um, so, in the next slide, this talks about how we don't really want to throw away those intervals um, just because we're not going to use them necessarily for our average everyday tuning or analysis. Um, we still need to recognize they're there because they can be very helpful. Um, in this case, uh, 13 over 12 and 14 over 13 are very, very close to a six-tone raised half-step. Um, they're both five cents away, so they're about equidistant. Um, I chose 13 over 12 because, as you can see, it has a lower tenny height. Um, but there might be situations where using 14 over 13 is more appropriate. For example, if you're creating a chord that uses 14 over 9. Um, so uh, we can listen to this chord that will have 1 over 1, 13 over 12, and 14 over 9. I'm going to play it. Uh, can I just get a thumbs up if you hear it? Okay, and then if we replace 13 over 12 with 14 over 13. slightly different chord, um, but I think it's worth looking at. Um, in the next table, I have the combined tenny height for that entire chord, and we can see that with 13 over 12, we do have a higher tenny height for the chord than if we use um, 14 over 13. Um, it might be a relatively small amount, but I think, again, it's worth considering. I want to just play it one more time so we can hear. So again, this is 13 over 12 with 14 over 9. And replace with 14 over 13. It's a really small difference, um, but to my ears, the second one is, has a slightly more mellow quality. Um, it's something that we could consider when we're constructing chords, that we might use some alternate intervals, uh, even if they're not included in our scale. Um, so here, this shows an example of how that happens, even within our five limit. Um, it's kind of the same phenomenon where, um, as we uh, increase our limit, we get more and more divisions, especially towards the beginning of the octave. Um, in this case, most musicians are tuning their major second to 9 over 8, um, but 10 over 9 is also a 5 limit option, and it's also relatively consonant. Um, so, in this case, uh, when we create a chord using the minor third, and I've displaced the 9 over 8 by an octave, so it's a little bit easier to hear, um, we can hear that we have kind of the same phenomenon where 10 over 9 might be a better choice, has a, a smaller combined tenny height value, 
um, than using 9 over 8 in this particular chord. So um, here's the chord with 9 over 8. So again, I think it's a, a, a small difference, but you know we're all about small differences here. So worth considering that even in five limit, we have kind of alternate intervals that maybe we should consider even in a classical setting or you know the chamber setting. All right, so moving on to 19 limit 12th tones. Um, so kind of the natural next step was just dividing by further divisions. Um, in order to get accurate further divisions, we had to go to a higher limit. Um, in this case, I felt the 19 limit um, was the way to go, trying to not go higher than we need to. Uh, 17 and 19 limit give us really close approximations of um, our 12 EDO. For example, we have like 19 over 16, which is 297.51 cents. Um, really close to like an equal tempered minor third. Um, so this is the first half of it because there's 72 of them. It's on two pages, so this is the other half of the octave. Again, I'm using two tritones. In this case, we can see uh, the upper tritone is 603 cents, so which means the lower tritone is only six cents away at 597. Um, so if you were playing a piece you know, thinking of this intonation system of a 17 or 19 limit tritone, it's only 16 or only six cents away, depending on which one you chose. But you would still, you know, make an interpretive choice, and that's mostly to to maintain the symmetry of the scale. Um, for this complete scale, again, we have an equal number of otonal and utonal, um, and that's because that's what we do in the five limit. Um, other than we don't have a duplicated tritone in the five limit. Um, we have 6, 19 limit, 18, 17 limit, 12, 13 limit, 12, 11 limit, 12, 7 limit, 8, 5 limit. I can't read the last one. 4, 3 limit, right? Um, so again, we have a diversity of options. Uh, for example, if we wanted to create a chord which emphasizes kind of a 17 limit sound, we would have a lot of options to use. Um, while we still have 13 limit, 11 limit, 7 limit options. Okay, so um, here are these are arranged by order of ascending tenny height. Again, only up to the tritone, just so we can fit it on one page. The same things that uh, we said before are going to apply, like our perfect fourth is going to be our most constant interval. Um, but we get some really good information about some of these intervals that we're less familiar with um, in the middle. And we could, you know, we could say, you know, that this interval is at least less complex than this other one, um, even though it might be a quarter tone, sixth tone, twelfth tone, whatever. In this case, I use normalized tenny height. Um, so as I said before, I reduced by one any of the values which were increased um, by being an utonal value. Um, so in this case, you know, this does change things. Uh, the minor third, for example, is actually slightly more consonant than the major third if we use this system. So uh, it's something that we have to think about, you know, whether, whether we think that a reciprocal has the same consonance value as um, the original ratio, whether a perfect fifth and a perfect fourth um, are equivalent or not. Um, and I think it's kind of interesting to look at both. Uh, so in this case, it's just kind of nice to, to see how these intervals stack up um, without being punished by being a, a reciprocal. Okay, so I want to look a little bit at um, how I've implemented some of this by looking at um, the first move of my string quartet in 13 limit harmony. First, we'll just look at the first six bars. Um, all of this notation is approximated. So I use plus or minus to show plus or minus 16 cents or about a 12th tone. 
up or down arrow for 33 cents, about a six tone, and our regular quarter tone notation for the quarter tones. Um, this is the entire pitch collection for the first movement. Um, so you see we are 13 limit. Uh, I'll keep going. So um, before I get into the individual scales that I constructed, I just want to look at our major and minor scales using the ratios. And what we notice with a major scale is we have mostly O-tonal intervals with one U-tonal interval. And with a minor scale, we have mostly U-tonal intervals with two O-tonal uh, intervals, which was something that I really considered when constructing these scales. For example, our main key center in C is like an U-tonal dominated scale with just two O-tonals. The F key center does some modal mixture, so our green one is O-tonal dominated, red is U-tonal dominated, and yellow is kind of interchangeable, and the B-flat key center is O-tonal dominated. Um, I want to play the C key center scale, just so you can hear it. So, that is kind of the main key center for the piece. Um, doing a little bit of analysis. I'm going to move this window over. Um, so, uh, I want to listen to some of the chords. I have the combined tenny height calculated. I used a lot of pentachords in this piece just because I like how they sound. Um, so, our first chord um, is kind of, we could consider it our one chord. Um, and it has the lowest tenny height value of the, the chords that I use. So, we can listen to that. Hang on. Okay. All right, so the first chord, our one chord. And then we'll consider the second chord kind of a passing chord and look at the third chord. And the next chord I've analyzed is what I call our four plus chord. Um, which uses a 12th, 12th tone raised major third um, in measure two, the third chord. And if we look at our combined tenny height for that, we have a higher value, more dissonant chord. And finally, the measure five chord, um, which is kind of a, a mixed chord of O-tonal and U-tonal intervals. has a lot in common with the first chord, kind of just a more dissonant version of it. And just for context, um, so that we can hear a pentachord five limit, we can hear this, this would be like a minor nine chord. Um, we can see it has much, much lower combined tending height value. So comparatively, um, really consonant compared to those. Okay, so um, this piece was recorded in a reading session by the Ligeti Quartet based in London, UK. It's part of their workout session, which was kind of an online quarantine recording session. They recorded uh, pieces by a bunch of composers. Um, the recording quality is not the best. They had to do it in some uh, kind of a practice room instead of a hall, I assume because of uh, COVID restrictions. I just got this yesterday, actually. Um, but I was really happy that they, you know, took the time to record it. It's definitely a difficult piece to put together in a short amount of time. So I will play it and show the score here.
Okay. So. Sorry, Jacob. Two more minutes. Yeah. Two more minutes. Okay. I'm I'm at the end basically. So uh, some final thoughts. Further divisions. Um, you know, should we look at twenty fourth tones, forty eighth tones? Um, at at what limit does this? You know, how how far should we continue this? I'm sure Johnny has some thoughts on that. Um, Tenny height as a useful measure of consonants. Um, I find it to be something useful, um, but it definitely has some flaws. I don't think it's a, a perfect representation of consonants. It kind of gets in the psychoacoustics. Maybe that's something that we can't measure. Um, should it be normalized? Should we consider reciprocals to have the same consonants value? Um, Otonality and utonality and prime limit as methods of scale construction. Um, is that more useful for, for these equal divisions of the octave? Um, yeah, most of the questions I have for you. Um, if you have any questions for me, I would love to hear them. Congratulations, uh, Jacob. Thank, Thank you very you. much uh, for your presentation. You're very happy to, uh, to know uh, a new side uh, of your of your work. Actually, yeah. uh, multifaceted. Actually, it's good to know. Um, and I would like to ask in the in the round if anyone has any particular questions. Uh, Hans Günther. Just. Uh just a little little question and uh, how you um, how you worked uh, how you made this combined uh, tenny height uh, is it just uh, the average of both uh, intervals or some other method and uh, did i understand and there are the the, um, uh, the um, normalized uh, tenny height is just uh, without the uh, number 2 um, okay so for the first question when you uh, Take a combined tenny height. You take all of the ratios used, and you find the least common multiple for all all of the all of the numbers. So, if you had say 11 over 9 and 13 over 12, you'd find the least common multiple of 11, 9, 13, and 12, and then you would take the log base two of that. Um, sorry, what was the second question? And uh, the um, normalized uh, tenny oh, height. Oh, right. So for, for tenny height, um, the reciprocal is always plus one. So mm -hmm. the um, three over two will, will have one less than, than four over three. So you can either add one to three over two or subtract one to four over three. And you can do that for every reciprocal ratio if you want to say that the reciprocals are, have equal complexity. And you can kind of look at the numbers in a different way. Mm -hmm. Uh, where I can find this uh, theory described? Uh, I'm not sure about that. That's kind of something that I was experimenting with myself, um, oh. just analyzing these numbers. Uh, I think, again, you have to kind of decide if, if you find that to be useful. There's, there's a few really good papers on tenny height, though, um, but I haven't seen any that discuss normalizing them. That's just something that I've been kind of throwing around. Because I couldn't find that, for instance, in uh, Zena Monique Wiki, where we where normally you found found the most of the theoretic things. Yeah, I, I haven't seen anyone normalizing the heights. I think a lot of people tend to agree that the reciprocals are by nature more complex. I mm -hmm. I, I think that's up up to interpretation, perhaps. Thank you. Um, and Richard uh, has a question, I guess. Yeah. Um, greetings, Jacob. I remember our our substantive conversation after the 2019 yeah. symposium at the airport. Right. Uh, my question is not in any way technical, but I'm just wondering how uh, you know the events of the subsequent uh, uh, time uh, affected your musical life, uh, specifically of course, the pandemic. 
Yeah, well, it's been a really strange time for a freelance musician, that's for sure. Um, I've been I've done a lot of outdoor concerts, which is lucky. I've done a lot of Zoom lessons, and uh, like the string quartet I, I wrote last summer, I'm still working on it, but managed to finish the first movement for this uh, call for scores. And uh, yeah, you know, being at home a lot gave me a lot of time to think about microtone, I guess. <laughs> I'm I'm just wondering if you see the world differently and therefore the place of music in the world differently. Well, I would definitely say that if there's any ever a time to take some risks with music, might as well be now, right? <laughs> yes. Thanks. And and so Jacob the uh, Ligeti Quartet, they will play the piece when when uh, that was just a reading session. Yeah, they put it up on their website um, as they, they did a workshop, which I think they have some feedback, which I actually haven't heard yet. Um, I don't know if they're going to do a public performance. I think it depends on the quarantine situation in England. So uh, we'll see. But, you know, for me, it's just really good feedback to do some editing and finish finish the rest of the piece. Yes, yes. yes. I have the impression that the Ligue de Quartet played about 10% uh, from the intervals into made them uh, uh, right. So, <laughs> yeah, well, they did, a lot they did a lot better than I expected. Yes, we did. Given, yes, yes, <laughs> given yes, the did. complexity of the piece, mm -hmm. I think. Mean, yeah. But I know. think it's a really good piece, but it should be Thank interpreted you. by a good uh, and yeah. And I think it. I think it takes and toning, uh, quartet. <laughs> yeah, I think it takes a little bit more time mm -hmm. and practice mm -hmm. to really nail everything in there. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course, there are several stages, and and Victor Puskar mentioned before about the magic words for the musicians. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> I, I think it's a, a matter yeah. of of how the stages yeah. in your in in the practice, of course, in the learning of the pieces. Yeah. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, I know one of the members wrote a <clears throat> wrote a doctoral thesis on just intonation. So they they were they were serious about their attempts. I think you know they okay. they premiered very many pieces. So mm -hmm. maybe it's just a matter of more time with the piece. Yes, you know? yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so um, one, one question, perhaps. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, we still have five minutes for ah, questions. Fine, yeah, fine. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, have a so question. any more yeah. questions? Johnny, in the... Johnny has a question. Uh, okay, great. And, and the tiny uh, height seems uh, to me very. Uh, com uh, Johnny, com can 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 you uh, ask to uh, mute? Johnny, also, isn't? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh -huh. okay uh, uh -huh. So uh, part of what your uh, reaction to the performance is. Um, you don't really hear the tone of the string quartet. Yeah. I'm thinking, um, is the calculation of the harmonic relationship of timbre part of your equation? I would say probably not. I mean, um, I, I think one of, one of my disappointments in that recording is the room that they use. And uh, it, it's a very poor room, and I think they use not such a good microphone either. So I think a lot of the, the resonance is really missing. And, but you're right, it might be related to that too, is, you know, it, some it, of these. I'm just thinking ahead. there's a third tuning in play, mm. which would be the harmonic timbre tuning. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think you can really hear that like when, when I've written some open strings, like those low C's in the cello, you really hear the harmonics coming through. And the um, last part, I, I want to make sure you cover before I, we yeah. run out of time, is how then is the calculation of vibrato, which they didn't really do, how, how would that then either uh, disguise that third tuning, which we didn't hear anyway, mm -hmm. or enhance it in any way or actually disguise it in any way? I think that, that's, those are great questions. I think, you know, the, there's this whole other level of interpretation that, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, there's so much information in the score as a composer already. And, uh, you know, maybe that's things that I could consider and include. And maybe that's something that the, the performers need to consider. Yeah, good question, so. Thank you. Yeah. Consideration. I think Johannes has a uh, last uh, question. One little question. Uh, yeah. uh, Tony High seems to me quite considerable, considerably, and I found out that the critical bandwidth is a border between recognition of 
intervals very good and very bad with more uh, and so numbers of of tiny height higher than seven are very difficult to recognize isn't it yeah yeah i would agree and that that's kind mm -hmm. of an interesting cutoff point to think mm -hmm. about that you know once we go above a certain point we start yeah, getting yes, to yes. I, the bandwidth could be the point yeah yeah mm -hmm. well, I, I i'm really interested in tenny height i think i think it's mm -hmm. a very interesting like way to measure these mm -hmm. kind of things and and to i want to look further into to how we can kind of group intervals yeah. together using mm -hmm. that yeah Fine. thank you mm -hmm. Okay, I think, yes, uh, so Jacob, I think now no more time for, or some, somebody has a very last question, short one in the group. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, uh, thank Jacob. You. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Congratulations. Bravo. Thank you so much. Okay, so we will move forward to uh, Ger Fogel. They are again with us, Ger Fogel and uh, da uh, David uh, Dornick from, from here, from Austria. <laughs> and they are going to present uh, pseudo-spectral composition and improvisation techniques in 31 Edo. Ger Fogel, uh, keyboardist and composer, member of the ensembles D. Sil Silton, Three Geogema, Elias uh, Stemeseda, sorry, <laughs> and Ger Fogel, Flower, uh, or, and, and others. Right. Latest uh, releases include the albums Three, uh, Three Between a Rock and a Hard Place in uh, 2019, Georg Vogel Solo Piano Live at Moors Festival 2018, uh, Prime Zone Live at Jazz Festival Salfelden in 2017, and Flower Duft 2015. Builder of uh, enharmonic keyboard instruments based on split sharps, inter alia, and the uh, um, 31 plus 5 tone M clavitones. And David, uh, David Dornick, guitarist and composer, member of the ensembles De Silton, uh, hexatonal conductor, composer, and guitarist of the Max Brandt, uh, Brandt Ensemble. The repertoire of De Silton is composed by Ger Fogel and David Dornick. All pieces ha have N tablet metrics, modulation, shift, shifting rhythms, contrapuntal melodies and tonalities with more than 12 notes per octave in common, mostly in 31 Edo, as well as related just intonation. So please welcome Ger Fogel and uh, David uh, Dornick. Thank you, Thank you. Hello. Thank Great you. to see you. Hello. Start with Um. I'm going to share my screen one, one second. Right. So I hope you can see a uh, presentation. Is that so? Right, I guess. Yeah. No, no we don't see it. Uh, yeah, now. No, it's okay. Now. Oh, okay. Yes, great. Lovely. Okay. Um, so. Uh, uh, hello, hello again, and uh, thank you for inviting us. Uh, first up, I want to say a few words about 31 Equal Temperament. I mean, most of you do probably know already everything about it, but uh, uh, just a recap for those who don't. Um, the idea of 31 steps in an octave is not quite new. Um, uh, in his book, uh, Antica Musica Ridotta alla Moderna Practica, printed in 1555 in Rome, Nicola Vicentino, probably first, presented the idea. It's basically a, an, as an extension of quarter comma mean tone, and it can represent not only the diatonic and chromatic genre of ancient Greek music theory, but also the enharmonic genre. And this is basically a tetrachord with a, um, with a major third and two quarter tones, which interestingly enough, does not really work too well in 31 EDO because 5 to 4 as the major third 
several instruments uh, built for 31 EDO uh, or quarter comma mean tone. Um, uh, and for instance, as you can see here, taken from the website of Studio 31, uh, the Archicembalo, which Antino uh, in invented, uh, and the Arco Arganum, these are recent builds. And then there was the Clavimusicum Omnitonum, which is also uh, the uh, uh, an inspiration well, for gas instruments, which we will see shortly. And then there was this very um, mysterious uh, Sambuca Lincea uh, from Fabio Colonna, which had uh, several um, 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 uh, duplicates of the same note uh, to have better fingerings possible than on Vicentino's Archicembalo. And of course, a bunch of not too widely spread theory uh, in those times in the 17th and 16th century. And then, of course, in the 18th and uh, in the 1950s, we had this small renaissance of the tuning with Adrian Fokker, who built this organ, which is in Amsterdam now. And he really spread the word about uh, 31 EDO. He wrote several papers and had, had a lot of readings. And that's why it's probably a very uh, popular tuning. He, of course, uh, was very inspired by uh, Christian Huygens work. And so this is not... Uh, not something too recent. Um, and yeah, it, uh, 31 EDO is basically uh, very close to quarter comma mean tone. And uh, also, uh, as a, this means, of course, that uh, chromatic, diatonic, and enharmonic harmony of the West can be perfectly represented in a uh, mean tone kind of intonation. And without even changing the notation, which is also very special, and uh, of course, you have a lot of more unusual intervals to play with. And yeah, that's why uh, we are playing in this tuning basically uh, for a long time now, and it never gets boring. We uh, in our trio Zilton with Valentin Duit, Georg Vogel, and I uh, have also built several instruments to uh, play in this tuning. And some of them we're going to uh, share with you uh, now as a short recap this is uh, uh one of my 31 tone guitars and one of the clavitones and i'm gonna switch to the camera real, i think um how do i do that um stop sharing is there something like this um so stop share yes right so do you see us now we see your presentation and we see you as well. Right. Now we just we don't see your presentation, we just see you. Yeah, so this is uh, one of the guitars, uh, which has um, um, quite a lot of frets and quite a lot of strings. So we can go to, uh, to Contra E. Um, and now wait, wait, this one is uh, in thirds tuning. And then we have one uh, a six string uh, the six string uh, I don't know how it's called in English uh, high resonance uh, with f holes and then we have this one which uh, has a very this. This one, is, this one is in fourth tuning uh, and has some fifths with a special capo. And then we have a classical guitar. Sorry, there's a string broken right now. Um, these are all in 31. And then we have a bass, which is built by uh, John Kettler which most of you probably know, Johnny, of course, played with him a lot. Yeah, there was also a, a steel string guitar, but it was stolen. And now we want to show you some of Georg's instruments. He, will, he has one also behind us. 
uh, which is a small version. And uh, yeah, maybe Georg, you want to tell us something about the clavitone? So hello, everybody. The clavitone is a um, member of the split sharps keyboards family. And um, it's coming from the mean tone temperament, as David mentioned. So the first row is for C sharp and then E flat, F sharp, um, G sharp and B flat for the for the for the sharps and flats and then it's the other way around so it's about um coming from tetrachords and expanding the chain of fourths that's not a typical isomorphic microtonal layout but um it's about transposing some important intervals which are fourths and fifths and major thirds and minor thirds that's basically the idea coming from quad to comma mean tone and then doing slightly adaptions for the um, circulating system of 31, which is very close, as David already mentioned. Yeah. So uh, you can see now uh, the uh, electro, uh, yeah, electro uh, mechanical clavitone, a clavitone. Uh, this has strings, uh, uh, which are like a clavichord uh, hit by hammers underneath the keys. And this one is MIDI, a MIDI controller. They were all built by Georg Vogel. Uh, yeah, we, we built uh, together on some on this one and uh, on an acoustic one on the and on the keys for this one, but mostly it was all done by Georg himself um, in his atelier. And here you can see one picture of uh, the the keyboards and the guitar in action. Uh, this was taken this year uh, by in the Puggy and Bass. Yeah, all right. Uh, so just uh, an introduction to the tuning and to Tilton. And here we can see, of course, some of the intervals in 31 um, and possible uh, comparison, uh, com possible intervals to compare them with. Um, and you can see they all have very useful approximations of these. These are just uh, my choice of, uh, of intervals to compare, of course. There are many more to, uh, to, uh, to view the temperament. Um, if you really look at the, at the primes to 23, we can see that none of them are worse than the major third in 12 videos. So um, very, uh, depending on the context, very useful. Um, and here are some more uh, intervals compared with uh, 31. The ones in the middle are always really close, while the other ones are a bit further. But uh, we have in this the octatonic uh, uh, scale of the, of the harmonic series, the fourth octave. And you can see most of them are really useful. Ah, okay. Uh, the, the, Errors, the deviations underneath the underneath the ratios are in a thirty-one et sense. So these are percent of a thirty-one tone step. So actually, ten, minus ten means minus three point nine cents because one thirty-one edo step is about thirty-nine cents. And so uh, these deviations look way higher than they actually are if you think about cents. Uh, I didn't think about it. I didn't change it. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. So uh, I also looked at the um, uh, 47 odd limit. These are without the uh, inversions of the intervals. Um, and as you can see, uh, I picked out um, intervals which are closer than 10% uh, of a 31 tone step, which is 3.9 cents. And some of many are very, very close. So it works very well as a spectral tuning. Uh, we can see 17 to 13 is especially close. These are also, uh, a part, uh, so 10 plus or minus 10 is actually 3.9 cents because it's a percent of a 31 ton step, if you will. And uh, yeah, if you take 17 to 13 uh, to the power of 31, it's only 2.7398 cents uh, from 12, 12 octaves. So that's very close. And as it's a prime tuning, 
uh, as 31 is a prime, uh, you can take every interval to as a generator for the whole uh, tuning system, which is a remarkable uh, property, of course, for every uh, prime EDO. And 17 to 13 works as a really nice JI um, approximation. Now, uh, my first uh, way to view 31 as a temperament was my string quartet Schatten der Prismen. And this was basically in uh, in 31 limit uh, just into, nah, I'm sorry, it was in 17 limit just intonation. And uh, I, I wrote it and then I we wanted to play it with the trio, uh, first the duo. And so uh, I had to, um, yeah, well, uh, adopted for 31 and mostly we did this as uh, Georg did this himself and I did it myself but when I wrote it down again it was a really interesting process to see how uh, well it worked um, especially the seven limit parts um, and this made me really realize 31 as a temperament even though I was working with a lot of um, uh, 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 serial composition techniques with 12 tone rows and stuff Here's the notation. It's very similar to the extended Helmholtz uh, Ellis JI pitch notation, but then takes some inspiration from Ben Johnson's notation. Um, yeah, you if you if you know those two uh, notations, you will figure it out easily. It's basically uh, a mix of those. So yeah, this is the same we saw before uh, for the for the trio. Um, yeah, and uh, also uh, this is the 12 tone row that the piece was based on. And you can see here the deviations uh, from the pure in 31 beneath the 12 tone row. Yeah, but basically what I wanted to say is that the having this, uh, this uh, string quartet in just intonation and uh, adopting it for 31, um, opened my eyes to see it as a, as approximations of whole number ratios and this influenced my whole compositional work for Zilton. Now uh, I think that's yeah the, these are some of the old keywords we used and they are all none of them have the full 31 so uh, I usually I take any spectral chord that works with these tunings, uh, if it's a, if one is available and also works with the tone roll and stuff, yeah. Now, uh, Georg is going to tell us about what we actually wanted to know: uh, the pseudo uh, spectral harmony that is not only seven limit. Uh, my string quartet that was mainly seven limit. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Just a moment. So we have to reopen it. Yeah. Okay, then now so. So, okay. I've uh, just. Uh, Okay. Um, uh, yes, the no. Okay. Okay. So, uh, good. Thank you, David. Now I want to to talk about um, intervals that are pseudo approximated in thirty one. So as we already heard to the limit of seven, the deviation is about nothing in 31. So it's very well approximated. And so summarizing the three, so the fifth is tempered and five is about pure and seven is about pure. So there are some intervals beyond that that are very close to the shape of 11 and beyond. And this interval we can see here, that's the double diminished fifth, is actually can be seen as an undecimal interval. So close to 11 to 8. I want to 
love to play this. This 11, if you want to look more de detailed, is not really pure, but it can be used as if it was pure for composition, which is what I want to uh, look at later. So this is the fingering at the 31 tone um, split sharps keyboard. The G double flat is located in the fourth row. So the deviation can be visualized as 176 to 175. So why is it that way? Um, because this tone is a G double flat, it can be localized diatonically. And the diatonic um, relations um, um, around this note can be um, um, yeah, it's located at the double flats. And it also can be located not only diatonically, but also with the spectral intonations um, <clears throat> of the of the fifth uh, of the quintal intervals. That's not the fifth, I mean the third. That's kind of confusing. But the third is about identical. The, the diatonic third is the fifth or harmonic. And the seventh is the augmented um, sixth. And now we are at the limit of uh, 11, and the undecimal intonation is the double diminished fifth in the quarter comma universe. And now what I wrote it in the last row, so we have the difference between 11 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, the, so that's 11 in, the, in this special um, um, octave of the harmonic series, and then it's close to 5 times 5 times 7. So what's 5 times 5 times 7 in, in, in 31 EDO um, quarter comma tuning? I will go to the spec. So 5 times 5 times 7 means 5 is the major third. And then another major third. So we're going, we're going from C to E and then to G sharp. And then from G sharp to G double flat, it's the septimal seven. <laughs> That's the seven limit, because all intervals used are at the limit of seven. So it's five to four, five to four, and then seven to four. And this together is 175. And as I wrote in the, in the second last row, 175 to 128 is um, four, uh, 500, you're still there? 541, um, which is, about um, identical to the to the 31 EDO interval. There is a very, very tiny um, deviation. And in the last row, the comparison to the undecimal interval, which is um, 10 cents off or the other way around. So these 10, 10 cents are the difference and that's, that's what I wanted to point out. Yes, so um, if it can be, um, the major third, the major third, and then the septimal seventh, it of course can also be approached in a different way using a major third, then the septimal seventh, and then the, uh, um, the other major third, which sounds like this. Um, can be 
funnel can be um, looked at in different from different perspectives. So it's on the one hand side, it's a seven limit node. On the other hand side, can be used as an undecimal inclination because it's so close, only ten cents, and it can be used as a spectral for spectral. <laughs> seven limit. So this is the third option. Um, you see the notation, the diatonic notation, which is one option to notate 31. Um, David is using intonation accidentals based on quad, um, quadratone notation. I'm using mostly diatonic um, accidentals, that means sharps and flats, double sharps and double flats. And um, under that you see um, how it's uh, located, where it's located on the on the split sharps uh, layout. <laughs> so that A sharp, that's the augmented sixth. It's an augmented triad starting from the septima seven. And of course, since it's, it is uh, an EDO, this can be transposed and can be played from every note, right? intonation uh, to just intonation to pseudo just intonation um, a view on 31 and the 13 can be visualized as the double augmented fifth which is one 31 step um, below the major sixth so this is how it looks on the on the claviton keyboard <laughs> From the upper C, it's a neutral third, and this is a neutral sixth, therefore. Again, the pseudo 13 can be visualized as the deviation between just intonation and the real 13, because 13 isn't pure. It purely intonated in 31 is the difference of um, uh, can be approximated as um, 105 to 104. So 105, that's 3 times 5 times 7. 3 is the 5th, um, 5 is the 3rd, and 7 is the septima 7th. And this compared to 13 in a different um, range. And then there's the comparison. Um, the 31 tone double div doubled augmented fifth is somewhere, um, somewhere between that because it involves also the fifth and the fifth is tempered in difference to the 11, a seven limit approx approximation which doesn't have any fifth and tempered interval, just the uh, seven and five. So in this case, we can see some close options. And again, the pure 
um, intonation, the just intonation of 13 to 8 is about 10 cents um, lower, and 105 to 64 is about the value of the temperament of the fifth um, bigger than the actual um, 22, 22nd step of 31. <laughs> how it can be visualized again on the keyboard if I use again the seven limit approximation and in this case it's um, which is tempered and then the septimal seven course in a different distribution it would look like this having the major third as the first interval then the septimal seventh and then the fifth and so um just I'm short this um interval of course can be transposed and to show is a composition technique I developed um, using the tones of 31 as if they were just intonation. And um, in the first column on um, the left side, you see 11, 7, 5, and 3. So these are the, the prime numbers. You have 3, that's the fifth, that's 5, that's the third, that's the seventh, and seven. And was explaining beforehand and then this changes going up every every next column so seven goes to the first row then it's seven five three eleven then five three eleven seven three eleven seven five and then again starting with eleven so that's the the, the generated hits. and then um how it can be visualized with the diatonic note names the root for the first chord is C, then it's G, E, A sharp, and G double flat. That, that's what I was explaining before. And then the G double flat stays, it becomes the septimal seven. And now this um, is kind of a practice of um, transposition in 31. And G double flat equals um, E double sharp and E double sharp is the septimal seventh of G sharp, the augmented um, sixth. So we have the first, um, first it was the G double flat was the, the 11 of a chord. G sharp, um, so this H sharp means B sharp. stays and becomes the third the the three which means the fifth always confusing so B, B sharp is now the fifth of the G of the E sharp and in the last row you see the roots changing so the same chord is modulating from C to G sharp, then to E sharp, and then the B, which is the 11 of this E sharp chord, um, becomes the septimal seventh of the D double flat, because the D double flat is the augmented sixth below the B. This B is a uh, English, um, or yeah, the English B flat. So. <laughs> Uh, no, it was.
was the yes now becomes the third which means the fifth technique to um, use just one voicing or chord and transpose it, to transpose it um, um, at least four times, but mostly more often. Excuse me, Georg, two yeah. minutes left. Two minutes, okay. So this is um, um, handwritten, the same thing actually I was explaining beforehand, but with a different um, selection, it's three, that means the fifth, seven, um, you can see that's the augmented um, sixth, that's the September seventh, then five means um, the third, and 13, as I was explaining beforehand, is the double augmented fifth. So this is a spectral chord, which sounds like this. And I was um, um, using this chord for this composition technique, and then it's modulating um, a lot of times. And this was the actual piece I was um, composing um, for the second voice and the third voice and the bass, they're playing the, sorry, they're playing the, the chords as they were um, generated and the guitar has a melody <laughs> um, that is within these um, chordal structures. This is another piece um, that was created using this technique for guitar. And it's about um, an upper structure triad of, an, again, a spectral chord having the 7, the 9, and the 11. And as we already know, this is the pseudo 11, and it's a pseudo 9, and it's the just 7. So this first, first chord is um, D double flat with D double flat, D double flat in the root. modulate to um, um, 63 tonal centers. So this, this is how, how I composed this. And this is how it actually looked then when I was arranging it for steel tone for three um, uh, voices, basically. So that's the guitar idea and um, bass and clavinet voice. So this was kind of the maximum. It's a nine voice. Um, uh, um, nine voices um, of of the same idea, having having um, the limit of um, seven, I think, no eleven, but with some um, some multiplications of those, like seventy seven. That's um, seven times eleven, and seven times five for thirty five, and so on. And in the last row, you see the roots how they go from G double flat to C, then E double flat, A flat, and so on. And this is how it looks um, in, in notation. Yes. So okay. that's from my side. That's the short introduction to this composition technique. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Oh. Congratulations. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry I have to interrupt uh, no. before. <laughs> it's really a very unpleasant uh, work for me, <laughs> but I, I unfortunately I have to, to keep everything as uh, so much as scheduled as possible. Yes. And I would like to ask in the in the round in the group if anyone has uh, questions. I think my colleague uh, Johannes. I think he has a question, but um, <laughs> uh, many. Yeah, we discuss already <laughs> we a few discuss aspects later yeah. on. Then, yeah, maybe, I think. <laughs> but uh, maybe somebody would like to to ask uh, some questions to, uh, after this fantastic presentation. Okay. Other otherwise. Uh, hmm. <laughs> that's that's too much. Uh, much I should ask, but when you put together uh, different intervals like eleven to eight, seven to four, and five to four, and three to two, uh, then in summary they not added but multiplied, and, and there comes 
uh, six sample, the result is 1,155 to 1,024. <laughs> yes. Uh, and, and you must imagine this interval, what could it be? It, it remains to uh, a neutral second, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 11 to 10, is it right? Uh, uh -huh, that's it, uh -huh. that's the whole difference. But, but you, it, it's so much to do in this uh, in this case and, and, uh, and in the mathematics and in the practices. And I think you are the best way, and you <clears throat> and you make many thoughts about uh, the the composition of sounds mm -hmm. and. And you will often will be surprised what what a small difference would make in the ex, in, in the result. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think you have you will have a uh, lot of fun <laughs> to discover the new sounds and yeah, the best mm -hmm. way to do that. And I would like to hear the last piece, but I don't think we have time enough. Yeah. It's not too late, and we will see again and hear again, of course. And yeah. I'm looking forward to for it's most interesting the music, especially you make. And mm -hmm. oh, uh, we have we, we uh, stay in connection, and I want to ask you if you will send me sometimes uh, one of your pieces. Yeah, cool. Fine. You, you <laughs> come to Salzburg uh, uh -huh. often, I guess. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yes. Then yes. You have my phone number. I will give you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes, 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 uh -huh. we keep in contact. Uh -huh. and, uh, uh, so any questions, any questions in the group, please? Otherwise, I will, I will have a little question. Okay, 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 okay I go. I want it to be the last one, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and not <laughs> like, talk enough. Um, because I, I love, uh, I really love the music of Nicola Vincentino. And uh, I, I'm wondering, we met a few times, but we didn't talk enough, actually, because uh, twice you came here, and those twice times, I guess I was busy with some problem happening that I had to take care, or once was with a rehearsal, and we didn't, I mean, I missed so much uh, from you. And uh, I don't know if you played or improvised any of Vincentino's uh, music, or maybe if you transcribed uh, David Vincentino's music to the guitar, because that that would be for me for me really amazing. I don't know if you. No, I didn't do that, but it's uh, it's, it's certainly interesting. Uh, you have to, of course, you you know guitar. You would have to make compromises, but I have enough strings to try. So. <laughs> yeah, it's an it's amazing right, guitar. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah, yeah maybe so, the classical one would be suited best. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, mm. nah, sure, of course, uh, it's very, uh, uh, very adventurous and surprising. His music, uh, very, very, um, yeah. Uh, if you know music uh, from this time uh, that is widely spread, then it comes as a real surprise what he's doing, and uh, of course, uh, also the excuse, excuse, uh, this, the the the. That he wanted to have it exclusively, this kind of uh, effect um, he was going for, not for everyone, so to mm -hmm. say, that uh, that he was uh, thinking even that back then that music was too widely spread and too available for everyone, and that he wanted this uh, very special music for uh, for some people, mm -hmm. and this is uh, uh, yeah. I, I think it shows in his approach to just wow with his small interval uh, uh, transpositions and stuff. Yeah, mm. <laughs> yes. Yes, I, I really hope that you know the community, the music community, invests a little bit of more time, more of work about uh, this uh, treasure that yes. he. He left for us, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah in, in, in Basel, the guys, they are doing a lot of his stuff, and it's really wonderful, of course. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. Yeah. yes, yes. Yeah, but, uh, I mean, uh, your work, I mean, you're doing also a fantastic uh, work 
really okay. amazing. Thank you. I have Thank a you. great admiration for you guys. We we love you from here. I mean, yeah. you were really impressed the first time I heard you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank really, you. It blew my mind. <laughs> and, oh, cool, cool. Uh, yeah, we are very happy to to see you here again. Nice, nice. Yeah. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank yeah. You. <laughs> yeah. I hope we can meet in person yeah, anytime in person. soon. And I also yeah. hope that we can play for you. Maybe yeah. the compositions Georg showed, maybe mm -hmm. maybe we can play them until then and then uh, we can it's better yeah. to talk about this stuff, of mm -hmm. course. Yeah. I'm really very much looking forward to these new compositions, these new uh -huh. work, new mm -hmm. themes uh, of you. Thank it's, you. It's uh, really mm -hmm. great to have this uh, these updates uh, from from your work. We are very lucky. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so Thanks much for having us. That yeah. is very nice. Great. Okay. okay, we still have one minute. Somebody has uh, still a question. People were uh, congratulating in the chat and also asking about your music. But if you uh, this Hilton in YouTube, you find uh, music or you have any any tips? Uh, yeah, I think Georg Vogel's homepage, maybe I can uh, show you. Wait a moment. Yeah, maybe if you can write it. Mm -hmm. uh, Is this here? Yeah. yeah. So, here. So, what that uh, so we all ca can see. Ah, ah yes, of course, yeah. Yeah, maybe yeah. Uh, there is, uh, especially on Georg's homepage, you find a lot of our stuff. And if you follow the YouTube links, uh, and maybe some Facebook links you can see it's on our channel and you can look for more videos there. I'll take a picture and share. <laughs> yes. Okay. For those who, who might not know. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah, so uh, now, yeah, thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, thank you for uh, having thank us. Thank you for having yeah. us. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you. And uh, yeah, okay. Hope to see you soon, yeah. Cool. Yes. Yeah, I hope to see you soon also in person, yeah? Yeah, cool. Next time, for yeah. sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> okay. We're looking forward. Mm -hmm. cool. Okay. So we continue now uh, to our last presentation uh, today, first day of the symposium. And I have uh, the pleasure uh, to present um, Richard Cameron Wolf and Harkov Guitar Quartet. Um, they are presenting Mirage de Sprit, uh, Suivons le Mirage uh, Lointain. Sorry about my French, uh, Richard. And I would like to say a couple of words about um, Richard. Uh, Richard Cameron Wolf was born in Cleveland, Ohio, and his early musical life, life was focused on the piano. He studied at Oberlin College uh, in Indiana University, where his principal teachers were Joseph Batista and Menahim Preslar Piano, Bernhard Haydn, Yanis Shenakis, and microtonalist John Eaton um, uh, for composition. In 1967, as a founding member of Fiasco, a very <laughs> UN I'm, academic I'm, multi I'm arts uh, <laughs> <laughs> collective, he began to compose inspired by dialogues with poets, dancers, and visual artists. He began formal master's degree composition studying in 1968. In 1974, Cameron Wolf moved to New York City, where he worked as a freelance musician, particu particularly in the New York City dance community. Uh, he then taught at Purchase uh, uh, College State University of New York from 1978 to 2002, resigning to devote more time to performing and composing. Since 2002, Camera Wolf has been focused on creating small sample psychologically interactive instrumental works, as well as micro operas. These often for a single musician, uh, in example, guitarist, percussionist, singer, most of his compositions are published by the American Composers Alliance and recordings of his compositions and piano performances. Dane uh, Rudyard, Eric Satie appear on the Opus One Innova, New Focus, uh, Furious Artisans and LTM labels. And on my um, cell phone, I have also 
the continuation uh, of, yes, the hard, oh, sorry about that. Oh, yes. Kharkiv Guitar Quartet was founded in uh, 2008 by a band of like-minded musicians. The ensemble has already won the attention of judges of numerous international festivals and competitions, including the International Festival of Contemporary Music, uh, Music Without Borders in, in Kharkiv, uh, Guitar Sprint Fest in Odessa, both in U Ukraine, uh, Symptomir uh, Musical Spring in the Ukraine, multi Multidisciplinary International Festival of uh, Contemporary uh, Art uh, Gokol Fest in Kiev, Kharkiv Assemblies in, in Kharkiv, Ukrainian National Classical Guitar Festival, Autumn Colors, uh, Belgorod International Classical Guitar Competition, and, and so on, many other festivals. Uh, um, the quartet has also collaborated on many projects with independent musicians and composers, poets, dancers, and painters actively participating in the cultural life of modern Ukraine, as well as beyond its uh, borders. The collective's uh, mission is to introduce the audience to best example of the art of contemporary music, music which is capable of speaking to the listener in the living and vibrant language of the present day. The members are Sergei Gorkusha, Maxim Trianov, Irina Polovinka, and Andri Brahim. So please welcome uh, Richard Cameron Wolf and Harkiv Guitar Quartet. Thank you, Augustine and Johannes. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here today, simultaneously in Salzburg and in the mountains of northern New Mexico. Uh, uh, today I've seen several uh, familiar faces, as well as many of you whom I'm now meeting for the first time. Uh, greetings to all of you. Uh, this will be a distinctly non-technical presentation, uh, which could be titled better late than never. Um, 2019 was the year of the microtone for me, a series of events through which I was transformed into becoming an amphibious composer at home on land, uh, that would be the 12 pitch resource, and in the aquatic realm of microtonality. That was my uh, 2019 metaphor since abandoned as I begin to learn to navigate sonido trece. Um, here's uh, that uh, timetable for 2009. Uh, in early 2009, I was invited by the Kharkov Guitar Quartet to make a short piece for their 10th anniversary concert. And you'll hear them perform this uh, new piece in a few minutes. Uh, I had already collaborated with them beginning in 2014, creating a 30 minute cantata setting seven ancient mystical texts and scored for soprano, baritone, cello, uh, small madrigal group and guitar quartet. Uh, during that period, they taught me how and how not to write for the guitar. The jury has not yet delivered a verdict on that, however. Uh, while composing this quartet, I attended a March 2019 uh, memorial concert for my beloved mentor, the microtonalist John Eaton, with whom I studied in the 1970s uh, at Indiana University. In that concert, along with Eaton's own microtonal music, uh, my flute guitar duo Kyrie Mantra Four was performed in the transcription by Sergei Gorkishin, uh, guitar one of the uh, Kharkov Quartet. Uh, the guitar spoke to me in that performance, uh, beautifully performed, by the way, by Dan Lippel. Uh, Dan, are you still here? I don't see you. Well, anyway, uh, I became even more determined at that point to explore the guitar's microtonal potential. 
uh, June 8, uh, the quartet's 10th anniversary concert at Kharkov's Opera House, uh, uh, performing my Baudelaire-inspired Mirage d'Esprit premiere. Uh, June 28, here at the in-person Small is Beautiful Symposium, some of you participating today heard an excellent live performance of my early microtonal flute trio, Carrier Mantra. Uh, and then on June 30th, I presented a lecture, Microtones on the Human Psyche, the legacy of composer John Eaton. Uh, during that symposium, I was invited to write a piece for the Salzburg-based Gunnar Berg Ensemble. Uh, the result was Passionate Geometries. Uh, micro opera, that's it. that is micro in duration, but uh, also microtonal in pitch material. Uh, here used primarily to build the dramatic environment, uh, traditionally the role of lighting, costume and scenery, and also to clarify the kaleidoscopic states of mind and emotions of the micro opera's protagonist. Uh, plans to perform and record it were suspended due to the pandemic, and uh, it has not yet been premiered. And so the year 2019 initiated a new cycle in my creative life at the age of 75, better late than never, uh, in which microtonality will most certainly play an important role. Uh, Augustine, do you have uh, the uh, video uh, ready to uh, to play? <laughs> that, yeah, 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 could you? Ludlaska. <laughs>
Oh, thank you, my dear friends. Thank you. Congratulations. Bravo. Very nice. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, dear Richard, for this incredibly beautiful poetical piece. No, it's just the recipe in the cookbook, and you did the cooking, and you created the cuisine. <laughs> You're always very poetic, not just your music. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Uh, you know, I'm I'm so humbled by the uh, by the sessions that I've visited today, and uh, I am truly a, a novice in in the microtonal realm. But I'm I'm still going to go ahead and and tell you uh, you know how I put this piece together, and then I'm, I'd like to invite the uh, quartet to give their perspective from the performer side. Please. Uh, so first of all, um, I was struck with this question, 24 strings and only 12 shared pitches? Didn't seem fair, not very generous. Uh, why not give the 24 strings a 48 pitch vocabulary? And uh, the way I achieved this was uh, by the scordatura tuning. Now, guitar four uh, has normal tuning except for the low E, which is tuned down to uh, C sharp. Um, the uh, uh, low E and A strings of guitars one, two, and three are tuned normally. Uh, but then the fun begins. Uh, with uh, guitar three, the upper four strings are tuned an eighth tone higher. Uh, guitar two, uh, the upper four strings are tuned a quarter tone higher, and guitar one, three-eighths higher. Um, therefore, uh, there are many options available, uh, depending on the number of guitars playing at any given time, and which guitars are playing, 
I can have access to many 12, 24, 36, and uh, 48 pitch pallets. In fact, too many. Uh, it seems that most of my composing energy is devoted to exclusion rather than inclusion, making a minimal selection from a vast array of options. And that selection must have the potential of interacting in meaningful ways, ultimately offering the possibility of yielding a, a unified composition. Uh, at least for now in this phase of my exploration, uh, I work with microtones in order to achieve a variety of tonal densities, uh, what I think of as deliciously complex harmonic territories. Well, so let me turn it over to the, the quartet members. Uh, unfortunately, Sergei Gorkusha is not uh, available for the session. And uh, just, uh, you know, let it loose. Tell me, tell me about your experience with this music. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, we now only in trio format, but Sergey gives you a big hugs and uh, say hello to all the audience of this uh, beautiful event. Uh, so I want to start with uh, some basic things. By the way, we now situated in the same room that we uh, recorded this piece. So it's actually homemade video. Sorry for that, but uh, lockdown uh, and uh, quarantine uh, difficulties uh, uh, are now um, shaping our art in this way. Um, I want to start uh, from um, basic um, uh, basic uh, words about uh, our art and how it's related to um, uh, to actual um, microtonal art and um, some basic words about our music. So historically, uh, Ukraine as a part of USSR has a rich history in the, what we call now modernism or futurism art movement. Kharkiv originally was a capital of Ukrainian socialistic republic, so many of innovative by thinking and experimental by nature artists has uh, uh, was there at the time of beginning of the 20th century. Most forward-thinking Kharkiv composers of the time was uh, Joseph Schillinger, uh, Nikolai Roslovets, uh, and uh, many others. Some of their works known as bright example of uh, pre-Second World War avant-garde. Poets like Velimir Hlebnikov, painters uh, like Vasily Yermilov and many, many others was at the beginning of rethinking European art. And uh, I think that you, everybody know that um, microtonality was a part of so-called uh, Futurist Manifesto. There was a composer such like a uh, grandson of um, Nikolai Rimsky korsakov uh, and um, Arseniy Avramov, who was at this time already uh, thinking um, narrower uh, uh, than uh, just a um, semitone. So, um, you know that all these composers was not really appreciated by um, government. So many of them um, ends their lives in jail or uh, they went, uh, as we call it, uh, um, life, uh, uh, lifetime um, uh, traveling uh, to uh, gather a folklore, a lifetime a folklore expedition, you know, uh, when uh, they was sending apart from big cities uh, to the villages uh, just to gather uh, folk music. And uh, from um, beginning of uh, 1990, 
uh, first year, the beginning of first year of Ukrainian independence, in independence we uh, have the new page of our musical history and composers, uh, for example, like Alexander Shetinsky, uh, write in 1992 year um, this piece, three sketches in micro uh, in quarter tonality. Uh, this piece is written uh, for two guitars that tune it the same principle uh, like in Mirage. So actually uh, we had this similar uh, tuning when uh, first guitar is um, tuned normally uh, as we call it traditional tuning and other guitars it tuned below or higher than uh, normal pitch. So Shetinsky was at the time and uh, we had some experience in guitar microtonal music. Then we had a beautiful opportunity to work with uh, Richard Cameron Wolf and Agustin Castilla Villa. Uh, these composers um, explode our um, microtonal vision, uh, let's call this way uh, and uh, we really grateful um, we really grateful uh, for these beautiful musicians that uh, they um, put their interest in guitar world because I think guitar is really 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 um, a grateful instrument uh, for a microtonal experiment and now I will give uh, a word to Irina. She will uh, tell uh, something about uh, uh, Quartet Mirage Desprit. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to tell about our first experience. And uh, I want to tell that, that uh, when we rehearsed uh, the Mirage Desprit of the first time, uh, we had a very strange experience. Why? Because of tuning. Uh, it seemed uh, that uh, the sound was diluted and microtonality in this piece creates new dimension of oral um, sension. And uh, as we hear the piece, uh, you could notice that uh, some unique uh, timbral changes of the guitar sounds um, is in the piece. Thank you. <laughs> so, so what you're suggesting is that that when the differently tuned instruments come together, that that uh, collectively they create uh, unique timbres that weren't available to your ears uh, in traditional tuning. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Uh, I must mention this uh, new timbral, um, uh, new th uh, th timbral material works for this uh, kind of um, main idea of the pieces to create uh, main idea of the piece to create uh, some unique atmosphere of uh, miraging uh, that. Uh, something that uh, already um, not really not not has a exact shape and uh, always uh, stays in uh, the focusing you know um, uh, you must catch in uh, catch in the focus but it always run through your fingers like a sand <laughs> mm -hmm. oh. uh, I'm wondering now for the first time, if the shape of the guitar, the traditional shape of the classical guitar, uh, uh, might be modified in order to accommodate uh, this elusive uh, microtonal uh, uh, timbre world. Uh, you should suggest some space. shape. You know the 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 overall uh, shape of the instrument, the the size of the resonating chamber, etc. Yeah, you know um, uh, the 
modern classical guitar is really young instrument if we compare to the shape of violin for example yeah so uh, for me it's always in a progress it's a thing that can be changed it must be uh, changed and i think it's my personal opinion that the shape of uh, the shape and the construction details of uh, a modern classical guitar is a thing that can be changed mm -hmm. can be um, discovered mm -hmm. in the sense of uh, new timbral possibilities mm. uh, and by the way uh, any of you who are uh, uh, listening to this conversation uh, please feel free to join. I don't think we need to wait for a question and answer session like we would have after uh, after a lecture. Uh, so if you have any questions uh, for the guitarists or for me uh, or any contributions to this discussion, please jump right in. Uh -huh. Thank you very much, Richard. I, I really love this format, this interview between the composer and the performers. This is one of my favorite uh, formats. And I think it's very enriching, very intimate. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for your, for your fantastic contribution. And uh, Harkov Guitar Quartet, thank you for, for this backup. Tomorrow I will try again before connecting with everyone to make sure that this with the audio, that I don't have this problem again. So I really appreciate that uh, you corrected my mistake. And I'd like to ask in the group if uh, there are any, any questions around. Or, or maybe while people, uh, the participants, think about the questions, Richard yeah, is poetic and very humble. I'd like to remind uh, everyone, uh, for those who maybe uh, uh, were not with us this morning, uh, here is a very valuable article uh, written by Richard Cameron Wolf about the legacy of John Eaton. Uh, Richard, I have to send you the book still. Sorry, I, I, I <laughs> was a bit busy <laughs> these days. But on Monday, I, I sent everything, I promise. And um, I also like to mention, uh, I didn't want to be too personal at the beginning. Uh, and I, uh, I had the pleasure, uh, uh, and I, as a composer, I am very thankful to Harkov Guitar Quartet because they are very responsible for two or three, th I can't remember, I'm sorry, <laughs> I think three guitar quartets, which is one of my favorite combinations, uh, ensemble combinations. And it, I, I, I could be one hour talking about uh, great words about you uh, guys, but I also leave uh, some space for other musicians to ask anything they, if they thought about any thoughts. Okay. Oh, perhaps on the breaks during the day, uh, you should serve beer instead of coffee. <laughs> and then you'd have more conversations by the evening. Uh, and, and by the way, <laughs> not by the way, beer. Also, the, there was one point I also, I, I wanted to apologize publicly because I tried uh, to bring, I mean, we tried um, to bring Harkov Guitar Quartet to the symposium in 2019 and through the Ukrainian Institute for Culture. Unfortunately, I, I, I didn't succeed uh, to, bring, to bring you guys here. It's great that at least we see you, you are with us online. But I hope that uh, next time, I hope you can, you can make it in the next physical edition. I really hope yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. We're you. looking forward to meet you personally. <laughs> yes. Wow. Oh, uh, Irina, uh, are you wearing the red socks from the video? <laughs> I was wondering. No. <laughs> oh, it's a pity. <laughs> Not today. Uh, it's I, very I have... hot in Ukraine. You know, uh, we have um, about a 30, um, 30 degree by, by Celsius now. <laughs> oh, I see. I see. Well, I just want to explain to, to the other people uh, uh, hearing this uh, 
wonderful conversation, at least from my point of view, that there's no indication of red socks in the Mirage <laughs> score. <laughs> <laughs> so it's part of the interpretation of the artist. But I, um, I will bring them to the next concert. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Maybe from now on, a lot of people, a lot of quartets, uh, somebody will be, will be wearing red socks. <laughs> it's oh. really, well, all, all I, I four. found everything very poetic, really, the whole oh. work. Oh. Oh. Let me see, I think I had... Uh, uh, most most Eastern European folkloric music uh, is full of uh, microtonal inflection, uh, even specific songs in which certain pitches uh, are traditionally sung uh, away from uh, away from the uh, the usual twelve suspects, if we can call them that. Uh, uh, that that isn't the case in in the United States, except in uh, communities of uh, nationalities which which had microtones in their tradition. Um, how do you, as as uh, Ukrainians, uh, process that? Uh, once once you then go into the conservatory, where everything has to be quote unquote in tune. Um, I will try, Richard, I will try to answer this question, how I understand it, because it's really hard to tell, um, yes, there is a deviation from the equal temperament scale, yeah, in uh, our traditional music, uh, but uh, this is a theme of discussion, uh, it's a topic uh, which discuss many of uh, musicologists, uh, musicologists and uh, tradition, traditional musicians rethinking now an uh, extremely, um, extremely powerful wave of new uh, folkloric ensembles uh, in Ukraine, uh, rethinking this culture. And uh, what's about uh, microtonality? It's hard, uh, really hard to say. Um, uh, does they hear uh, it like a microtonal or just they don't uh, don't really care about pitch and uh, make it like um, how to say um, uh, make it like a resculpting of the melody uh, from ear to ear uh, uh, can, do you understand me um. Yes, but I mean, I think it's even like a problem of music uh, moving into uh, a university setting, uh, even what we call classical music in general, that then we're subject to all kinds of rules. Uh, it may very well be that a particular Ukrainian folk song always uses a particular mode, uh, which is not consistent with uh, with tempered tuning. Uh, yeah, what I, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, what and, I know. Please, please tell. Oh no, and, and and so I'm 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 wondering if you know if if we end up going through this straitjacket of of uh, you know the the uh, musicological uh, theoretical rules that that dominated uh university uh musical thinking for uh for decades and decades uh and then to unlearn that in order to uh, for our ears and our sensibility to welcome uh uh microtones you know uh, um, here is um, in this conference uh, uh, Viktor Pushka uh, takes his part and uh, he is also from Ukraine and I think he uh, knows this theme uh, way better than me but I know from many sources that uh, even traditional instrument bandura Mm, uh, which is really like uh, for our guitarists is like a 
grandparent instrument. Uh, Bandura has uh, its traditional unique uh, tunings not equal temper, ter, temperament tuning and even uh, our um, really great and famous uh, Bandurist uh, and uh, theoretic um, Gnat Hotkevich uh, wrote in his book about uh, Bandura something about uh, not standard tunings but it's I think it's a theme for fu uh, further investigation mm -hmm. it's really interesting topic and uh, now uh, musicologists in Ukraine really uh, just digging the surface um, to uh, dig wider and uh, discover a new uh, connections um, between the tunings and the different styles of singing and so on and so on uh, oh, Mr. Locke, you have a, a, a question, a contribution? Uh, 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 I just wanted to say, Hans, uh, Günther Locke uh, has a question. Yes, uh, uh, just, a, just a comment. And I think we should, uh, should uh, we could say that uh, no ethnic uh, music culture will have uh, 12 EDO uh, as basic. So uh, uh, that, uh, that is clear, I think. And... Uh, and uh, generally, uh, so uh, we have to uh, reject that the uh, 12 EDO is something, uh, something as, a, as a standard. It's only a standard in keyboard instruments uh, in, um, in Western, uh, uh, Western uh, uh, classical music tradition, that's all. And, uh, and the others, other thing, of course, if we talk about universities, so if we have the chance, uh, if we are as a... Uh, as uh, many of us are university teachers, so we should change the rules. Yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, well, I have another question, if there's time, and, yes. and that is, you know, with with unfretted stringed instruments, let, let's say let's say a string quartet, uh, when composing for uh, string quartet microtonally. How do does the performer deal with the subconscious tuning that the ear does in the historical repertoire uh, and and avoid that subconscious tuning when uh, when dealing with a microtonally uh, generated melodic line, for example? For whom was the question? Yes, uh, that was my question as well. Well, uh, for for you, Mr. Locke, for anyone else who's uh, who's uh, viewing this, who has a thought or has had an experience with stringed instruments, uh, that unconscious tuning that an unfretted player does and has been trained to do uh, could be the enemy of uh, of good performance. Uh, of uh, microtonal score. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, you know, I remember Stadler uh, String Quartet, mm -hmm. a concert many years ago. The viola player was fantastic playing microtones because of his uh, musical background. So I think it's a matter of, of this, as you said, this feeling for uh, microtonality. Mm -hmm. I think it's in the background, uh, depending on their involvement with uh, folk music and maybe Hans Günther can continue. Yes, I will say that, uh, of course, it is a learning, uh, it's a, it's a learning issue. I have uh, experienced uh, uh, that by myself as an, uh, as an uh, more or less amateur violinist and uh, I have seen that, uh, uh, that with uh, other um, uh, a string players say not every day uh, deal with uh, uh, microtonality, so they can learn it. Of course, sometimes it's like this: uh, this they learn it, and and uh, so if, uh, of course, in some state in between is like this. If you uh, um, have uh, it half learned, then it might be that uh, if you lose the concentration, or as long as the piece uh, goes, then you will automatically uh, fall back uh, in uh, standard intonation. That is, of course, it's happened. But I think, uh, I think it. Uh, 
of course it uh, it is it's a training issue it needs uh, uh, it needs really time and maybe uh, I see here Gerhard, uh, you are here, and uh, maybe comment that uh, from your uh, from your perspective as uh, my uh, soloist for for the violin concerto. Uh, yes, uh, hello again. Yeah, uh, I I must say I because I have been free, uh, not playing in any uh, so to say say twelve twelve tone. Uh, uh, context. I was free for retrain myself. So uh, a year or even longer, we trained with Hans, or Hans trained with me. So um, I was uh, free to retrain my ear and also my my finger uh, work. So and uh, because I have have been open to uh, new nuances uh, all the time, so this was not a problem at all for me. On the other hand, having been trained. As a, a professional violinist, all the training was for me useful. We talked about intervals which were approximate to the 12 tone EDO, so it helped me to orient uh, myself uh, in Bowl and Pierce in this case. So, this was, uh, I think, it is both useful. It is the, the level of being conscious about. Uh, what you are doing with your instrument and uh, let's say I have never played the guitar so frets I'm afraid of frets I'm sorry for <laughs> all guitar players I really admire your uh, your skills etc I re really love uh, the guitar but I really also love the freedom of having no frets and being then uh, on my own being a bit in the wild but then I have to rely really on my ear and on my fingers so this is uh, which which is amazing i see a, a big uh, big future in uh, thinking uh, a micro in micro tonal systems i see it with my students at Tallinn university they are not professional musicians they are not so trained as uh, students that may come to the music academy so and i see they are off off of tuning they are off the 12 tone row they can't even sing uh, um, a normal uh, chromatic scale, but I'm very uh, uh, interested in, in in testing microtonal other scales on them because they might be fresh for for receiving and perceiving other scales because they are not overloaded with the heavy tradition. So that's my short or long statement. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I need to uh, add something, if we, if I can, just a few words uh, to uh, say about um, guitar and not really guitar. Um, uh, I think a really important role in developing of ear uh, to this microtonal uh, hearing um, plays uh, the digital technologies and also computer. Uh, so we actually use these digital tuners, small digital tuners, we just convert uh, uh, what pitch in uh, Hertz uh, it must be and uh, play uh, tune uh, guitar not by the ear but with digital tuners but I saw a concert of uh, this um, um, improviser and composer Catherine Lamb maybe you know uh, her, uh, she use uh, uh, this tuner called strobe tuner uh, to make exact pitch uh, in uh, this deviation in sense uh, it can be shown really precise now uh, so it's a point uh, I think uh, these digital devices really helps Yes, Mr. Law. Yes, exactly. Uh, maybe uh, my uh, talk was very, uh, really, uh, very limited. I put to ma make an overview, but uh, exactly these uh, digital uh, possibilities they are so uh, so fantastic, and uh, they are now uh, really uh, cheap and reliable. And uh, so we are also in uh, West Virginia, and uh, we worked with. Um, uh, with uh, tuners or we worked with um, guide tracks so we uh, listened in uh, headphones uh, the um, electronic generated uh, um, 
um, sound file and uh, and that helps uh, helps a lot uh, also for recording because uh, but of course uh, I, I at the end I had the feeling okay uh, I I listen to the guy tracks uh, but uh, I'm I'm if you do it uh, as long as much with this electronic helps then you will say okay I I cannot uh, maybe maybe uh, the same uh, uh, the same way without uh, without this electronic uh, aid Johnny Can you turn on your your microphone Johnny So uh, I was thinking though as a bassoon player which is a different uh, approach to these issues. Um, my first response to Richard is that you're speaking, I think, and I don't want to mansplain it or anything, you know, but I think I interpret what you're saying as a kind of uh, mental frets that are being crossed in performance. And it's almost as if we are pianos that have been uh, stretched at a particular set of frequencies. And when they change just one time, they're going to snap back to their previous positions. Um, to uh, Hans, uh, we used a chord 212 tuner in the early 80s for all the instrumentalists, including the New York Philharmonic oboe player, um, to tune A440. It had a quartz memory accurate to one cent. And what we did is what we did with the metronome, we internalized. So there's like a series of people I could point to that did learn to hear one cent, but not to hear it, which is the way everyone talks about it, but to produce it. Actually to produce it without hearing it first. Uh, Dave Taylor is doing that on trim, uh, bass trombone. You know, he'll produce a piece that I write for him accurately, and he, he knows I can sing it for him. But he won't know if it's right or wrong unless I say it's right or wrong. Because he doesn't have the confidence. So you bring up this other point, which is that we need this confidence, more important than almost anything else to know that the next time we'll be able to do that same microtonal interval. And it's really just one at a time. As you get them one at a time, then all the systems, they all, you know, uh, Venn diagram into each other. And, uh, you know, it's like uh, David Hikes with the overtone singing. He's modulating by taking a harmonic and changing what its role is. Now it's a tonic. Or well, he's kind of sizing, actually, would be more accurate. So um, I, I really think that the ear is actually more accurate than the machine. It's just that we don't, we haven't learned to trust it yet. Uh, uh, individual players have. But for the composer to trust, you know, violinist XYZ, that's a risk they haven't been willing to take yet. And so that becomes already the difference between, I think a profound difference between writing for the person as opposed to the instrument, or of course, in this case, the group. So that's the response to that. And I do have one small comment if I can for the group, the quartet. Uh, as a guitar uh, uh, listener, because I'm not that, you know, I, Boy, do I know my inadequacies in composing for guitar as a non-guitarist. Believe me, I, I do. And I worked at it. I've tried. I've, you know, I do my best. But what, what is interesting, what, what bothers me is the lack of certainty that when you press down the strings, whatever they're being pressed down, that they haven't slid only up, of course, unless you really work it. You know, the fact that you're going to move them up slightly in groups, you know, when you're going to do three or four notes at a time, you know, fretted, you're going to like slide some more than others. And so right away, without vibrato, I'm, I'm, I have this, I, what do we call it, a, a kind of a uncertainty principle. 
But, you know, people are going to be sensitive to different things. I'm sensitive to that. You know, I don't think it was a big issue in Richard's piece. But, you know, in, in another piece of music, it's, it's really a big issue. And, of course, it could be, you know, basically it's getting back to this idea that once you, you know, I'm sorry if I'm talking a lot about this, but um, it, it's important, I think, that people hear a different side to this, which is what I hope I'm, I'm trying to present. So to my ear, I can measure it polymicrotonal because as I've intimated in an earliest question or comment, I think polymicrotonal, which is what I heard in Richard's piece, is the future of writing. I agree, definitely. Well, and most definitely. certainly, most certainly, we uh, hear best what most interests us. And so, the big question, I think, is you know we've got this sonic garden, and people have have planted all kinds of uh, microtonality in that garden and harvested into pieces. But what we don't have is a good distributor, a good public relations way of getting the music out into the ears of people in interesting, engaging pieces that will make them want to be able to hear uh, what, what you, Johnny, uh, already hear so readily. It comes from your, your interest in your love for uh, microtonality? Uh, some of it is certainly, um, you know, a, a gift, you know, we all have our skill sets and uh, some of it is uh, ignoring the academic world, really ignoring it, accepting that the whole idea of consonance and dissonance is social construct. Yeah. You know, um, and, and I try to give examples and obviously, it, you know, using uh, Augustine's uh, term, it blows people's mind and then they can't recover fast enough to respond because it, requ it requires contemplation and, and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, the integrity that you're going to be serious to develop your ear training, that you're going to actually follow a plan, a method to improve what you hear. A lot of people, I think... Um, are almost too uh, open about what they can hear because there's a wide variety, actually. So, you know, I, I've learned not to make expectations anymore of other people, but people have to make their own plans. And where is such a thing? So, of course, I'll be talking about that at the end of the uh, festival, you know, through a place where you can learn that, you know, because we don't have that. But um, I think the knowledge to have it is available, but it, it does require a certain um, orientation towards it, you know, a willingness, a, a road that's been followed already. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a microtonal superstar for every instrument, I think, at this point in history. You're a superstar for us, well, for everyone. I, I try and, with the bassoon. And I'm sure... <laughs> You can hear 128 divisions? Well, I mean, you know, I still think the, the interesting thing about 128 is that I figured out the fingerings without a machine. And, oh, and, it's, and it's not with perfect pitch because I don't have it. So it's really just letting the bassoon become a monochord. Right? I mean, it's, it's using natural... Uh, qualities that the instrument gives you and you just have to be willing mm -hmm. it's just more arcane on a bassoon you know you've got all those extra keys you know and you got velocity issues you know i mean how many guitar players ask i'm curious i actually think of starting the note above it or below it versus on top of it you know and then if you have a group they all have to feel the same way or no I would say yes. Mm -hmm. We once did a Bach performance, um, uh, Brandenburg 2. Actually, excuse me, let me say it better. It's Brandenburg 4, actually. 
Uh, and um, it was our first Brandenburg in Werkmeister three tuning. Whether you think that's his tuning or not, that's what we did. But from the very beginning, we were all stunned because some started above the note, some started below the note. And we had a nauseous quality that it took us a couple of bars to get, to get over it. And then we can lock in again and actually play the piece. But that's, that's real experimentation, that, that particular performance. It's, it's never been released. Mm. I would never release that. Mm. But you know, this is where the tuning has rules in performance that you have to become aware of. The whole one on a part or not doubling thirds makes a lot of sense. No parallel fifths, yet Bach does it. Makes sense if there's different size fifths. <laughs> Yes, yes, good point. No. So you're writing for Guitar Quartet, Johnny? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Sorry, no. <laughs> uh, but this, this is a, a matchmaking symposium, isn't it? <laughs> you can light a match. <laughs> <laughs> well, I dare you, Johnny, to write for this quartet. The last time someone dared me, I, I fell. <laughs> <laughs> now I was a teenager. <laughs> oh. Oh. No, no, no. I mean, well learned. but guitar players, seriously, how much do you take into account how much the string is stretched on the fret, which you could calculate probably how many cents difference it made. I'm sure you can hear that. You know, uh, the guitar is already a microtonal instrument. There is no uh, such thing like, uh, you know this joke, uh, how to make two guitarists playing in unison. You must kill one of the guitarists. So, uh, unison is impossible for us. So, it is deviation. Yeah, I know the piece. Uh, the, there is a Russian composer um, uh, who um, made this piece for guitar where he divided the pressure of the finger in three positions. Uh, slightly press it, uh, normally press it and hardly press it. So it's uh, already making this microtonal difference. I volunteer to add depress it. <laughs> depressed, okay. <laughs> depressed guitar, yeah. We, no, but in it's, Ukraine, it's true. Uh, you, you could say the violin has a disadvantage because everything's so close, you know, compared to a cello, for example. Right? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think you have a fudge factor. You know, that might be the American expression <laughs> for how many cents up or down you can go. And then I think back to Jacob Elkin, where he's figured out that there's a fudge factor, basically, that if you add the vibrato, it removes that fudge factor because it's all within three cents, four cents. So, uh, you know, that's why I think some of the sound we make is calculated, you know, on one level or not, another, I should say, uh, based on the difference of the instrument. So on the bassoon, I can get that exact match, but I don't do it by thinking, right? I can start below it. I can slide to wherever it needs to be. And then I have to do something with the mind, right? I could look at a dot on the wall, right? I used to do an exercise, one uh, cent up, two cents down, uh, two cents up, one cent down just when I'm playing a long note on a recorder until it sounded too artificial, you know? And so then I could do a warmer sound with vibrato, where I can bring in the harmonics in a different, you know, subtle way. So, you know, on the timbre side, that's uh, very important what you said. I, I knew the story of uh, St. Petersburg, not Kharkiv. But, you know, they were also a microtonal society. They also were broken up. They also were uh, thrown to you know, different cities in the rural area as punishment. Uh, so I knew the story from St. Petersburg and uh, I hadn't, uh, uh, you know, locked on to Kharkiv. I know Odessa a little bit. 
where, mm-hmm. you know, a whole culture of uh, Jewish music, you know, died and was transformed into, uh, uh, you know, party music, you know, basically. Uh, Klezmer. Yeah. yeah. Right. But that was orchestra music, and Russia was calling it jazz, you know, a, a Russian style of jazz. And uh, in Leonid that, Utosov. Do you mean Leonid Utosov, for example? Yeah. I, I do know that name. Oh, I, I, yeah. I recognize the name. Uh, I don't yeah, know if there's any exact recordings. Uh, I know that the recreations, they have their yeah, own. There is form some, of, yes, yes, there is. Yeah, I, I heard a little bit. I heard a little, enough to know, like a four, four rhythms where you move ahead on two, but you fall behind on four, <laughs> you know? That's consistent, which is a kind of a swing, you know, but it's a different uh, form. So and then I also was thinking of Bela Bartok, who was forced not to collect uh, ethnic music, but that he loved. He was forced into other things where they buried his work at Columbia University. So he, he, he did not get a, a warm welcome by the academic world. So look, that's part of the whole thing I think we're all dealing with. I think uh, Augustine is very quiet because he's in the Montreteum and You know, that's a good point of position. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. You know, Johnny, you just opened up a, a big can of worms, though, because, you know, if we're going to talk uh, so deeply into the realm of microtonality, then we also have to go deeply into the realm of micro time. You know, I mean, these these Baroque court dance threes and fours that have straight jacketed music for centuries. You know, uh, I mean, I, I try to liberate myself with that by, uh, by uh, structuring my macro and micro time uh, using uh, uh, the, tri- ti- the prime number series. But even that, again, even though it's an irrational uh, series, Uh, is not as as uh, developed as any of the microtonal systems I've already experienced in today's presentations. Micro time, mm-hmm. you know, where Absolutely. do the sounds? There's a uh, 16-year-old theorist from South Carolina who just produced an incredible theory paper uh, comparing the percentage of microtones in uh, the 10 most important microtonal works of the last five years with its use of time and rhythm outside of that standard straitjacket of 2-4 and 3-4. And they, it came to this uh, incredible result of 30%, that 30% of the notes would be considered microtones compared to the other notes. And that 30% of the rhythms with uh, Georg Friedrich Haas at the higher level of the rhythmic uh, uh, unusualness. It was amazing that I was actually following his work through the archive that we have in South Carolina. Mm. So, uh, you know, there is a focus on this. But what, one, I know you're biting at the bit here to ask me something, and, and I, wanna, I can't wait to hear it, but I want to also say it's not all neurosis. It's important for me to say that because uh, I'm saying Charles Ives has an ideology of extended Pythagorean when he writes his music. I'm saying that Johann Sebastian Bach has a ideology of a well temperament that I think is Berkmeister three, And I think Igor Stravinsky, this is a, something I'm working on right now, has uh, a, a 128 philosophy, believe it or not. Uh, eighth octave of the harmonic series because he uses modern notation. So he's using the tritone, which is the 181st harmonic in his music pr- in, a, in a prominent way. So he's using the eighth octave. And mm-hmm. with that in mind, there's actually an interpretation of straight harmonics from A for his music, mm-hmm. including the firebird and the rite of spring. So, there, you know, there, there may be, you know, 
Otto Luning would speak about a just intonation frame for his writing in equal temperament, right? Mm. There's a lot of, there are many composers I could name. So that's different than a mental fret that's a neurosis that will snap wrongly into place. <laughs> and, and, yeah, so and, no, and Johnny. Um, oh, but the bottom line is, though, that, uh, that we, we, and I'm, again, I say I'm just a novice in the microtonal world. Uh, I'm desperately looking for the forms that are appropriate to the sounds that, that I'm exploring. It's like, you know, make the punishment fit the crime. You know, that, that there has to be some kind of unity between time and, and the this, this sound spectrum. There is. They're all intervals. <laughs> That's the commonality. Yeah, yeah. But, but how to achieve that in, in terms of the macro and micro structures is a real challenge for me. Right. It's, it, it, that's the individual challenge, though, I think, for all of us, really. I, mean, uh, I uh, think for, for us in Tilton, this is really one of the main themes of our work, to have a, a kind of an equal amount of uh, rhythmic and uh, harmonic modulation, to have an, a comparable complexity of microtonal, uh, anyway, a uh, intervallic structure and rhythms and that's why our, uh, our rhythmic structures also go all over the place to have them comparable to the harmonic complexity and not uh, just focus on the one not the other and this is really challenging but also really interesting and liberating and uh, yeah it's, it's a really a, uh, a big uh, starting point for us because it's a long journey ahead <laughs> And uh, uh, David, uh, let me ask you something about this point. Uh, so do you think that so the idea uh, transcends from rhythm to microtonalism or the other way around? And it's the same question for Johnny. What, what, what do you guys think? Yeah. But time is a slow, is slow pitch. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Uh, I, I think um, microtonality... Uh, is not really the point here because it's just uh, if the if if you view the uh, the as Johnny says as if you you the, view the rhythms as whole number ratios, you can also use the intervals uh, view the intervals as whole number ratios. And if the complexity of the whole number ratios you use in the rhythms correlates somewhat with the complexity of the ratios you approximate or use in the in the intervals then that's uh, really a give and take and really a, a structure that is um, homogenous in some way. But uh, the, the one uh, influences the other. But uh, of course, because microtonality in our, in our field is a big challenge because there are not so many instruments and uh, it's not uh, so widely, widely spread the, what, what's done with it. Uh, that's uh, the reason, I think, why most people focus on the harmony Uh, because that's already a big challenge. But uh, yeah, you just have to take the plunge, I think. And <laughs> uh, But not to say that it has to be complex. It can be simple both ways. And that's also then the same approach. David, can we see you? Uh, yes, uh, I guess. <laughs> uh, David, I guess David, that goes completely with what is uh, an idealized... Uh, music education, which is not to teach element by element, yes, but to teach all of it simultaneously so that you have some kind of holistic approach to creation. Yes, yes. You know, that you have, that's, right? That's some, what, so, go ahead, sorry. No, 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 you're right. That's what I called it once, uh, a holistic approach. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you. No, no, no. But that, you know, that's it. But this is, uh, you know, for the music uh, teacher who's going to teach today, we're going to do rhythm. Yes. There's doing harm. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I see. And of course, they do. They do harm when they don't teach improvisation at all. But that's that's also always. Uh, uh, 
um, uh, danger in universities ev in every field that uh, you it, by giving some people uh, 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 um, uh, how to say uh, uh, um, already uh, uh, theorized already uh, 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 packed and sold uh, uh, a view of about something you and also the context of a university often gives people the oh i have to study this for this uh, examination and uh, it's not really interesting because that's not what where i am now and i just have to learn it and shovel it and uh, probably when i approach this field again i think back and it's ah this was this really hard uh, thing to learn and microtonality is uh, definitely something but uh, if it was taught on universities uh, this uh, many would uh, be like oh this is some really hard field and i don't want to have ever have to do microtonality again and uh, that but that's also always with university if uh, it takes from the people also and it as it, as much as it gives it's it's if if you're already there to to take the information uh then yeah of course then you can learn something from it and it can be very enriching uh enlightening and uh, but also it can be it can uh, throw you off some course and uh, give you some uh views about uh things that ah okay harmony works like that and there is cadences and uh this is uh, the palestrina way to do it and aha uh -huh, so you have to do it this way and that is then is rhythm this is a completely other thing and it works like this and uh it can be noted that this way and in india they do it differently but not uh not uh, i don't know how exactly uh and so yeah but i think uh, it's I really love this holistic approach that you go from numbers and uh, from your own ear and experience and resonance. Uh, so, so also a bit Helmholtz approach kind of uh, to uh, what is physically and uh, and uh, um, also from the experience what is music and I think that's what you're preaching, Johnny. And but uh, yeah, it's in a university context you can have the best ambitions and concepts i think uh, it's uh, whatever way you do it it will always throw people off and others uh, will be uh, will be better off and others not and uh, yeah it's uh, just well, a too interesting field to have it uh, another university i think <laughs> you have to approach it yourself you have to learn it uh, i think it's best if you just in uh, yeah grow by learning it the hard way Yes, we are talking about intuition. Uh, when, when, for example, Johnny just mentioned this, uh, he told me this idea of Stravinsky thinking in yeah. 128. That's interesting. Johnny, uh, uh, how much do you think he was aware of? And uh, do you think that was intuitively? And I'm, this starting is, to, I'm, I'm starting to think that's why he left St. Petersburg and never came back. Yes. Because with all that uh, microtonality in St. Petersburg, you know, like we were just talking about in Ukraine, um, there was nobody doing that. There was nobody. His grandson was doing just quarter tones, you know. So there was not, uh, you know, if you found somebody in mean tone or harmonics or, you know, just even. Uh, but, he, you know, it's not just overtone series because, you know, you can literally uh, and, and, you know, and I use the word literal. I mean, it's in the score that it's based on A. And there's nothing more natural in measuring harmonics than to start with an A. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it makes, it just makes spelling clear. Mm. And yeah. so, you know, there's a very famous response to a question that Stravinsky gave, you know, to somebody that was his assistant, you know, Croft, you know, uh, uh, Richard Kraft was it? Not Richard Kraft, Robert sorry. Kraft, uh, yeah. yeah, what was his name again? Robert Kraft. Robert yeah. Kraft, a conductor. Yeah. Um, he asked, you know, what's the most important thing, Mr. Stravinsky, my good friend, what's the most, who I drink with all the time, what's the most important thing to have a future in the world? You know, I'm, I'm, of course, I'm just brutalizing the actual words, but I'm paraphrasing. But there's no doubt the answer was the word pitch. And he brings in Vicentino, and he brings in uh, Adrian Villart, uh, who he says makes a quarter tone machine. 
ascribes 29 to the Archicembalo. I don't think that's right either. You know, it just shows you, though, what he's thinking. Then he immediately talks about an experience in Japan of a kind of gagaku, you know, where he's not even aware that each instrument has its own tuning, but he locks into the no flute, right? It's like a perfect distillation of his answer that it has to include ethnic music. And he says, the, the same day, I listened to an orchestral flute play in Japan. And there was a poverty in the intonation. So, you know, if the shop and the flat were no longer impoverished so that they were different, and you knew it wasn't a, a spiral of fifths like Ives, but in fact, just the harmonic series, then it would be very easy to give a 128 interpretation because it includes equal temperament. Mm. Mm. And e equal temperament actually does have to do with the eighth octave of the overtone series, which eighth octaves is the, uh, is the range of the orchestra. I mean, eight octaves, uh, uh, you know, I want you guys to know, since I saw you last, and some new people here, nice to meet you, I uh, wrote a piece for cello in the ninth octave of the overtone series. And only the virgin notes, meaning the notes that don't get repeated from previous octave. So guess what? It has 128 new pitches. Oh. Right? It's still 128, except it's the wrong 128. Mm. <laughs> so I, I, I call it um, uh, asteroid belt because it's like we're no longer with the planets. It's its own kind of, you know, I don't know how, I can't, I can't give it words until we hear it, but it basically is all the sounds you never heard, all the relationships you never heard. I think the only one you might recognize maybe is a sixth tone. That's it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, there's still room for explora ex exploration, of course. Uh, well, getting back to this uh, notion of uh, the holistic identity of a musical composition, uh, mm. did we ever get there in the first place? I don't remember. But uh, the biggest enemy is that it's a holistic bringing together of all these things that we've named in such detail, right down to their underwear. No. You know, the that there's so many names, you know, as soon as you name two things, you isolate them from each other. You know, I think we have to really be careful about, about, uh, you know, if moving forward into uh, a, a greater uh, proliferation of microtonal music that we don't invent even more terminology. Yes. You know, that it would find a way of stripping down the terminology so that it allows things to coexist without that definition separation. Yes, it becomes a flag. It's a word, but it's also a flag. And it, it's oh, yeah. your flag or it's not your flag. <laughs> and that's <laughs> a problem. That's true. I don't think you could prevent that because there's, no. a, uh, there's a population in the world that it's just, you know, that's their joy. That's their fascination with it is yeah. to come up with that new name and to juggle, you know, to give you a tuning that's not even the same on another day. You know, you know, they have uh, a lot of people complain, you know, you certainly must realize you're not the first to complain about it. But, you know, that's just part of the world. It's just going to get more and more complicated. It's just going to get fill up. But uh, you don't have to, like, focus on it. Yeah. But, but, but microtonality can allow us to become less complicated, you know? I mean, uh, traditional music is all about exclusion. It's all about, uh, you know, you're, you're an appoggiatura. We'll convert you. We'll resolve you. And then you're welcome in our society. You know, As a this modulation is like, you know, uh, l let's take a vacation to Canada. You know that, and the, but we have to come back home. Uh, you know, 
microtonality is is liberating and simplifying in a weird way to to my mind well certainly if you just sit on a just major triad i mean i i wonder why people do that still because you know after something's been done so often why would you want to keep doing that I mean, in a certain in a certain uh, case, it's a a photograph of you know what's going on on the planet, and you know it, you know in addition to the multiplying of names, nomenclature, you 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 know there's a I don't know I I I just I've been in a battle with a group that's called Anti Velati. They don't like the tuning. I don't know who knows it. Yeah, well, lots of club. But uh, you know, if you write for a piece of music in Vellani, there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, if I was to play Handel in Vellani that doesn't match, I could see you being a, you know, objecting. If you can't do the whole concert with different keyboards, with different players and different tunings, well, that's a financial problem, really. Maybe a production problem, but doesn't mean it can't be done. Certainly, with recording. So, um, I don't know. I, I'm still freaked out that um, John Dowland has still not been performed on the lute, to my satisfaction, in Dowland's own tuning, according to his son Robert. I still don't get it. I, I don't get it when pianists and violinists. Learn to play Mozart and Brahms and Tartini in historically appropriate tunings. Why they still go back to equal temperament, like that string that got retuned. You know, that's neurosis to me. And I think it's a deeper issue than any one note. You know, people with perfect pitch will hear a pitch that's not in tune with what their intellect tells them it is. And they have to be a good enough player that they don't pay attention to that. Mm. And let the note in the group uh, have different rules of acceptance. Mm. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I... People get their own disappointment, so I, I certainly understand Richard's with nomenclature. I'm just saying, you know, I do, I do understand, but uh, I'm so, you know, disappointed by so many other, you know, issues, <laughs> which is why, you know, I'm going to take a radical approach, as some of you know. Um, I'm really sorry to interrupt you. I I booked this conference rooms uh, conference room until eight thirty, and I don't know if somebody will. <laughs> <laughs> be yelling at me at me tomorrow morning. Uh, there's a lot of terminology with I wish I mean very good aspects in education in, in the music world, like the terminology, like education. Uh, like I agree with you so much, uh, uh, Johnny. There are not so many people like trying to teach your intuition when you're talking about or David your own experiences. We are talking about the same thing, actually, all of us. I think just uh, just to say something uh, to agree with you, actually, not that you think that I'm in another mind. I'm, I'm, I'm. Yeah. Anyway, you know me, Johnny. I my goal is to to achieve a, a university pos position. I'm really trying in the last couple of years. I'm trying to finish a doctorate to be a bit stronger academically because otherwise my work doesn't doesn't is not worth it. Uh, it's, it's not worth actually. So, um, but at the same time, you know, sometimes I, I I've been teaching at university, and I tell the students, uh, be careful because this is uh, I'm going to teach you all I can, but. Uh, even if it's again where the institution I have to defend, be careful because learning is not just going to university. It's not the only possibility. You can learn without going to university. Uh, you know this journey. 
And so it's very difficult, this terminology sometimes. And what I really find very sad is just seeing young people, young artists with a lot of ambitions. They believe, I mean, not just in the music discipline, they believe they have to learn some uh, regal, some rules, and they have to work with these rules. And it's, it's about, I mean, uh, yes, what, what is the point of writing this when it's already created? Just do something else or do it your way and develop your intuition. So that's uh, really, I think we all agree, and, but not, let's not be pessimistic. I think we are, at these ideas, new ideas are really growing. I see a lot of talented people, young people as well. And I think that maybe we are not aware of this, but the, the world is changing. And Hans Günther, okay, really, uh, just we should really be trying to finish, <laughs> otherwise they're gonna they're gonna be very mad at me. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. I just I add that, uh, of course, creativity uh, is not is not uh, the same. Uh, of working with creati cre creativity is not the same as. Uh, as uh, engineering, so uh, rules in engineering are very fixed and uh, lead to a concrete uh, result. But in in uh, in creativity, we have uh, sometimes rules and sometimes sometimes we uh, violate the rules or sometimes we uh, we create new rules and uh, and that is completely different uh, perspective and uh, that is sometimes maybe hard to uh, say to say to the students that. Uh, Okay, we have here some rules, but of course, at the end, nothing is fixed. Just um, yeah. for me. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I, I just want obligatory line. <laughs> All rules are social constructs. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, but that's what yes. university is for. University is to give you some tools to work in the world as a tool. Cool. That's why cool. it, that's why uh, there is concrete lines. That's why there's a processed, uh, um, yeah, a processed way of thinking about it, because but that's how gonna, it works in the world. But they're not going to volunteer that. They're yeah. going to tell you that you need to represent them when you go yeah. into the world. That's the oh. that's the point. But as a person, you can break out of it. But some yeah. some do never. So most yeah. No. Yes, yes, yes. Even, I, I don't know if I ever told you. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I'm really having a great time with you. I'm don't worry about scared. it. They kick around, don't worry. Uh, we'll go uh, again. Yeah, the problem is the first day. If it was the last day, I, w I, I, I would <laughs> care a, a little bit less. And, Look, uh, see if there's anybody uh, there. <laughs> uh, you, you know, in the 90s, I told John Schneider, of course, uh, you know, I read this book, uh, The Contemporary Guitar, and for the first time I read about microtonality. I was really so fascinated. And so I, uh, I did a lot of tries. I really wanted to hear microtones. And in a, in a way that was uh, not being able to acquire those uh, uh, microtonal guitars like from John Cutler, for example. So it forced me, yes. Great book. <laughs> First edition or the second one? Second. Ah, second. Ah, yes, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and the one I wrote in, in uh, I think I read in the nineties was the, the first edition, and uh, I created this microtonal system. I had to hide it from my guitar teachers. First time I went with the microtonal this scordatura system. I went to my teacher. He he she almost killed me, and she said, "Stop this bullshit." Okay, this is documented <laughs> like this. I'm sorry, I beg your pardon. And uh, and and so from that moment on, for a couple of years, I really couldn't speak. Uh, also to some colleagues, only if I really trusted them so much that I knew they wouldn't tell her. Otherwise, uh, and I had to for many years, and I was so scared about this. And I I'm very thankful to Robert Brightmore. I was so scared. <laughs> I thought he was going to be angry as uh, all previous persons uh, in the academic world I showed before. And he was completely the opposite. And he really, uh, 
uh, made, that was a very good feeling. Okay, somebody understands me. And back then, you know, no internet. I would, I didn't know any of you, and so it was completely different. And, mm. <laughs> and this, I'm sure, it happened in many places. I'm sure there are many talented people uh, in many places. But if somebody really manages your career and can st stop you, and you don't understand what's happening, it's 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 really a big loss. For, for, for us. Mm. I want to thank all of you here uh, for being my supportive teachers. <laughs> you know, and for not having to give me a grade. <laughs> <laughs> and, and a special thanks uh, to uh, Max and Irina and Andre. Andre, are you ha having a good time? <laughs> a man of very few words <laughs> but, but wonderful notes yeah most important line is for uh, fourth guitar i think oh yeah yeah, yeah. It's it, holds, it holds the quartet together mm. okay fundamental so, frequency sometimes <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so do we agree to continue tomorrow? <laughs> yeah, sure. sure. I thank you so much. I mean, I'm really thrilled about this conversation and uh, I'm very happy to hear all this contribution, this last spontaneous contributions. I, I really appreciate uh, your thoughts and your vision shaft, your knowledge. This is really a treasure to be, to live this moment with you guys. Take a picture. Thank you. Yes, Thank yes, you yes, much. yes. One last picture. Wait, wait, let's take a quick picture. Yes. Everybody shows the face. Johnny, lift your head. Okay, so Donnie. cheese. Yes. Okay. Cheese. Uh, okay, ah, Ivan, Ivan. Okay, it's great to see you. Ivan, the other one is missing. Uh, okay, great. Thank you so much. Grazie mille. Okay, cheese. <laughs> okay, I hope I hope I got it. Okay, so I will post some pictures in, in Facebook at the Ekmelik page and have a wonderful evening or a wonderful day for some of you. Wonderful night in, in the Ukraine. And uh, thank you so very much. We will continue tomorrow. And big thank hugs you. to all of you. <laughs> thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Good night. Bye.